It's a sunny day in January, and I'm walking through the West 76th Street Tunnel to Edgewater Beach. Usually, my companions on this walk are my husband and son. We go to Edgewater almost daily, especially in the warmer months. There's something about seeing the endless blue horizon of Lake Erie that soothes whatever particular anxiety is pulling at me. How's it going? Well, how are you? Good. You're Letitia? I am. Nice I to meet you. Do you want to say it? Okay. That's fine. <laughs> but joining me today is Leticia Maldonado, who grew up in the neighborhood in the 1980s. She still owns a house here, though she doesn't live in it. Her sons do. She now lives in the inner ring suburb of Cleveland Heights, where she works for the local school district as an administrative assistant. I met her through a neighborhood group on social media and asked her to take this walk with me and my colleague Drew Mazius, another resident of this neighborhood, because I wanted to hear how she remembered the tunnel being in her childhood compared with now. The entrance of the tunnel itself is framed by trees, bare for winter, of course, and ornamental white railings much different from how Leticia remembers it. In fact, she and her friends had a name for this tunnel and some of the others that led to the lake. The pissy tunnels, like, you know, (laughs) you smell deep urination, there was glass, um, litter. Um, Like I said, I don't even remember there being lights. If they were, they were extremely orange and dim, not enough to um, light it up and make you feel warm and welcoming. I mean, you knew if you rode your bike through there, you're coming home with a flat. (laughs) Whether on bike or on foot, she said, she and her friends would race through as quickly as they could. Because it was, it was scary. It was just, there was no housing. Yeah. And it was just like terrifying. Right. It wasn't like a street where like, you knew like when you came, it was like the end of the road type. Like if you get into some, excuse me, there was nobody here. Now though, the contrast could not be more dramatic. It went from gray to color. (laughs) Um, I guess that's my best descriptive about it. Let me be clear, this is still a tunnel. A tunnel that goes under some railroad tracks and then a quasi-freeway known as the West Shore Way. A tunnel is never going to be anyone's preferred way to get to the beach or anywhere, really. Still, compared to how this tunnel used to be, this is like paradise. I'm glad they have the LED. (laughs) In the middle, you get a break, coming out into open air for a moment to sweeping views of the beach and the lake. Visual encouragement that you're almost there. Even just this amazes me. Like the bike path, the walk path. White railing with the the waves kind of etched into this is when you see it from the tunnel, you're automatically invited. It's so inviting. Like, ooh, look at that path. Of all the physical changes that have happened in the neighborhood, the renovation of the 76th Street Tunnel may be one of the most symbolic because of how run down it used to be. The new tunnel broadcasts a message to everyone who uses it or drives past. The message is something like, this is a nice neighborhood now, in all capital letters. And even more symbolic than the tunnel itself is what it leads to. This is everything, like, just like right here. Just, it's like panoramic. A grand beach house made of gleaming blonde wood overlooking the equally gleaming Edgewater Beach. The beach, like the tunnel, has been transformed in the last decade, ever since the regional park system, Cleveland Metro Parks, took it over from the state of Ohio in 2013. And it stretches for half a mile, a perfect shade of tan, free of litter. In the summer, lifeguards make it safe to splash in the water. And beside the beach, tall, just manicured enough grasses wave in the sun. It's like a breath of fresh air, you know, because, like, it's the neighborhood I grew up in, and it's, like, what I would have loved to have, but now my kids get to enjoy it and see it like that. So it's like, you know, I could walk through the tunnels and tell them stories, like, oh, my gosh, you guys won't believe this. And they're looking at me like, what? (laughs) Like, to them, this is, like, suburban-ish. So it just, um, like I said, to walk through and just see all this, it's it's beautiful. It's inviting. It makes you want to be down here. It's friendly, you don't feel like, I'm gonna get attacked if I come down. Like there's a lot of pedestrian, (laughs) so much different, it's really breathtaking. I couldn't help but notice the break in Leticia's voice right there. And I asked her about it. I've seen so many people like move from their homes. Seen so many people 
Like they raise the taxes. I can't keep up with my taxes. I'm forced to move out and all for what? So you could have this nice pathway to the beach, you know? So of course there's an expense to it. You know, you take long life, long residents who would have loved to see something like this happen and they're no longer here to see it. At that point, because producer you know, Drew Mazius chimed in. I mean, I think the, the optics need to be acknowledged that like you have two middle-class white men asking a person of color about the change in the neighborhood. And I think most of the people we've seen on this walk in the last half hour have been 20, 30-year-old white people, yeah. you know? Those are the ones that are out enjoying this area, even in the middle of winter. I mean, it's funny you say that because, like, um, the one day my sons and I, we were, like, doing something in the yard, and there was this white lady walking her dog, and she was headed down, and my son was like, Mom, she has no idea where she's going. And I was like, it's safe now. <laughs> like, it's a different, you know, it's a different time. And she was, he was like, okay. Leticia said despite the complexities, she's still glad the tunnel and the park have been fixed up because it's places like this that have the potential to unify a very fragmented region. Using what's here already and just making it user-friendly um, so people know, like, to take advantage of all the resources in the city, you know, especially this beautiful park, because so many people have neglected it for so many years. I think it's like a link between the city, the suburbs, you know, and all other neighborhoods. How do neighborhoods, quote, get better? Why is this particular neighborhood one of them? That's coming up on Inside the Bricks, My Changing Neighborhood. Episode two, the tunnel that once was dirty and scary. So I'm actually joined by my neighbor, Ricky Moore, who you met in the last episode when I first talked to him over Zoom. And I remember from when I was, you know, when I first moved back here like 15 years ago, that people used to make jokes about Edgewater. They really absorbed what they saw on the news about it back then, which I think was a lot of like, oh, there are syringes and tampons, tampon applicators floating up on the beach. You know, it's like super dirty. I, and like, you know, did, did you do you remember that period? We all, yeah, we sort of like, I ain't going in that nasty water and, <laughs> you know, condoms on the, um, on the beach and beer cans and syringes and, you know, oh yeah, all kinds of dead fish. So yeah, so Cleveland Metro Parks gets out, out there almost every day in the warmer months to clean the beach with these big green John Deere tractors. Right. So, you know, it's expensive to do all that stuff. It was really expensive. But, I mean, can we talk about why they're doing all this stuff? Yeah. Because it's like, and I still mean it, I think it's great and I think it's wonderful, but... This didn't happen until the gentrification started. It's like, let's make these white people feel more comfortable and be more okay with taking their children down to the lake. We just went like how it was, you know what I mean? And I mean, I'm happy that now my nephews and my niece doesn't have to, you know, be afraid of, I'm, you know, step on a syringe or something like that. But, you know, it's just unfortunate that we didn't already have these things for the people that were already here. Like you said, they didn't care until the neighborhood started to gentrify. And when you say they, do you mean the Metro Parks or, or who do you, who are you thinking of? The powers that be, you know what I mean? Like they didn't care about those things until they knew for sure that this is a hit. People are coming in, they wanna live here, they're buying houses, you know, like it, it's they're pumping a lot of money into um, Detroit Shoreway. Like we need to make sure that, that we keep them here. Uh, 
My conversation with Leticia and then Ricky made me think that in some ways, you might think of the Metro Parks as an institutional gentrifier. They came into the neighborhood with a lot of money, and I think a lot of good intentions, just like a family renovating a house. And there are both good and bad consequences of that. I was curious about how the Metro Parks itself weighed all this. So I talked to Sean McDermott, who's their chief planning and design officer. Cleveland Metro Parks is Sean. Hey, Sean, it's Justin Glanville from IdeaStream. Hey, Justin, how are you? I, I apologize if I sound distracted. I just got a text of the first pictures of, were, were taken down a building on Irish Town Bend today. So On the day I talked to Sean, demolition crews are tearing down some low-income apartments on Irish Town Bend. That's a steep hillside along the Cuyahoga River in another gentrifying neighborhood a couple miles away from me. This all feels like a great transition into talking about some of the economics of parks and gentrification. Sean says, yes, where metro parks go, rising property values usually follow. In a broad manner, we've been able to demonstrate um, anywhere from a 5 to, to 20% increase in property values when you, near, when you are near or adjacent to a park or trail. Is that a goal of yours, to increase property values, or is it more like a byproduct of other goals, would you say? It is tangential. That is an outcome of the work that happens. I wouldn't say that that is a targeted goal. Uh, It just so happens that good planning, good connections, well-maintained parks result in an increase in property values. And we are a primarily tax-funded organization. We need to have a healthy Cuyahoga County. It is in our best interest that Cuyahoga County and Hinckley Township in Medina County are served well by Cleveland Metro Parks and are healthy areas that develop, redevelop, and maintain um, their standing so that our tax base is, is healthy. I mean, we, we depend on property taxes. How do you balance that with not wanting to make lower income people feel pressured to leave? It's a tough question because there are, well, there, I mean, I'm a planner. Right. And, and and you like to think that that the plans you work on and develop and, and collaborate on uh, have benefit for everyone. A, a rising tide lifts all ships. And there is certainly and it's not just in Cleveland, but there is certainly more discussions happening today than I think we've seen in a long time about housing insecurity and affordability. So that there are certainly in some specific areas some affordability questions. Um, But that is a, it's a big picture issue. And we're focused on bringing parks closer to people and giving anyone and everyone access to parks and trails and doing that in partnership with many, many different organizations. We certainly understand at at the same time, there's got to be a balance of both respecting the, the neighborhoods and those who live there and and redevelopment, and you know that's it's we, we got to be careful as um, as an organization because it's not you know our our job is to make sure that people are connected, and when there are opportunities or say a redevelopment, our job is to um, pay attention and to advocate for good smart redevelopment. Listening to Sean McDermott grapple honestly with these questions, I can relate. There's some of the same questions that I grapple with as a relative newcomer to my neighborhood, and that probably anyone should consider when they're making a decision about where to live and spend their money in a region as segregated and unequal as ours. I mean, asking the Metro Parks not to invest in low-income city neighborhoods, no one would want that, I don't think. But I think Sean hit on something really important, when he said part of Metro Park's job is to advocate for responsible redevelopment to go alongside making the great parks that drive up property values. Again, I'm looking at the Metro Parks not to pick on them, but because they provide kind of a manageable case study on how public investment can contribute to rising property values. There are so many other examples, some of which we'll touch on in this series. Various forms of tax breaks, where and how we build roads and highways, grants for rehabbing houses, 
When you put all those things together, they can really set the table for a neighborhood becoming too expensive for the people who already live there. But okay, gentrification. Let's talk about that word. We use it a lot now. But where did it come from? And what does it actually mean? That inequalities in income and social status and housing conditions are so striking. That's Ruth Glass. She was an urban sociologist who spent most of her career in Great Britain, though as you can probably tell from her accent, she was born and raised in Germany. Ruth Glass is the person who coined the term gentrification in the introduction of a book she published in 1964. You're hearing her speak right now in a television documentary from 12 years after that book about a gentrifying neighborhood in London called Camden. She cuts a striking figure, seated behind a desk, dark hair pulled. In short, she looks very much like she comes from, well, the gentry, at least, if not the aristocracy. And what does gentry mean exactly? Well, according to the Oxford Dictionary, it means people just below nobility and social rank, often those who own land, as in the landed gentry, which always makes me picture tri-corner hats and pantaloons. I was really glad to find this brief footage of Ruth Glass because she's become kind of a footnote in a field of study that she helped pioneer. But Ruth Glass had a lot more to offer than just that one word. As I listened to her talk, I realized that even in 1976, when this interview was recorded, she was already putting words to the dilemma we still find ourselves in today. That on the one hand, it's not good for poor people to be isolated in certain parts of the city or region. And on the other, it's also difficult to give them the means to stay as their neighborhoods get more shops and parks and nicer housing. Here's how she puts it. Is it not, for instance, better for Camden to have a socially mixed population than a one-class population? Does not the fact that a substantial prosperous group is balanced against a poor group of roughly the same size make it easier to mitigate the economic and housing problems of the poor group? Sadly, this is not so. What we do see in a place like Camden is not social balance or social mixture, but a network of social division. Remember how I said I was glad to find that footage? Well, that's true, but I was also kind of depressed by it. Here was the first official observer of gentrification saying that the social balance and social mixture that I feel exists right now in my neighborhood, they're an illusion at best. That in fact, based on her research, gentrifying neighborhoods get more socially stratified rather than less. The rich get richer and the poor end up being pushed out. And she doesn't offer much hope to those of us who want to keep the economic diversity of neighborhoods like mine. She once wrote, quote, Once this process of gentrification starts in a district, it goes on until all or most of the original working class occupiers are displaced. Folks in Boyle Heights have had enough standing at the steps of this art gallery. What are you doing? What the think you're doing? Angry when someone came to open. The gate was lifted and the protest continued, all in response to a possible hate crime investigation after someone vandalized the gallery door. I'm certainly not condemning it. I'm saying that this community has a right to resist its displacement by any means necessary, and that's what they're doing. And really, that viewpoint has set the tone for a lot of the research and writing about gentrification ever since, especially among academics and in media outlets that cater to affluent, college-educated audiences like the New York Times and The Atlantic, and yes, National Public Radio. The narrative has become very familiar. Gentrification leads first to resentment between newcomers and longtime residents, and then, inevitably, to the longtimers being forced to move away due to skyrocketing costs. If they got records of drugs, guns, sexual, anything sexual, then get them out of here. They hate people who enjoy live art. They don't want it. That's what the gentrifiers do. They move into a neighborhood because of the art, and they kill the art. These are the sounds of gentrification, anger, and fear in Chicago, Los Angeles, and Dallas. And let's call this out. 
there's a real difference in whether and how people experience gentrification according not only to their income level, but their race. There are very good reasons for that, according to Stacey Sutton. She's a black professor of urban planning at the University of Illinois at Chicago. The neighborhoods that are gentrifying across the country are disproportionately occupied by black and brown people. Thus, black and brown people are disproportionately being displaced. And typically, they're being displaced by the influx of white people. This is from a TED Talk that Sutton gave in 2014. She says many city neighborhoods, especially neighborhoods of color, were systematically redlined years ago. That caused disinvestment, and it depressed people's property values. Gentrification, in her view, happens when outsiders then take advantage of those low property values. So as higher-income people move to these areas, it's typically to capitalize on the low property values. In doing so, they inflate property values, displace low-income people, and fundamentally alter the culture and character of the neighborhood. You probably noticed Sutton used the term displace a couple of times there. She and other urban planners use that term in a few different ways. First of all, there's direct displacement. That one is pretty straightforward. It's where people can no longer afford their rents or property taxes, and they have to move out. And then there's indirect displacement, also known as exclusionary displacement. So exclusionary displacement then refers to the sense of isolation that people feel when their family and friends have been displaced. Their social network may be eroded, although they can remain in place. It also refers to the sense of isolation people feel from the influx of high-end restaurants and boutiques that they can't afford. This is like an exact description of what Ricky Moore was telling me about in the first episode when he was describing feeling out of place in the restaurant he worked at in his own neighborhood. A last point that Stacey Sutton made in this speech was to distinguish gentrification from revitalization. Gentrification is not the same as revitalization. Revitalization refers to neighborhood change, improvement, upgrading, but it's done from the bottom up. It's usually done with community residents and community organizations. But the most important point in in revitalization is that the neighborhood remains affordable for low-income people. But I'll be honest, I wondered if the lines between revitalization and gentrification can get kind of blurry. I mean, look at the story of the Edgewater Tunnel and the metro parks that opened this episode. Nobody was buying up houses or property in that case. On the surface, the only thing that happened was that a park and a beach were cleaned up and made more accessible. But the improvements made the neighborhood more attractive to people who did want to buy up houses and property. Was that an example of revitalization striking the match that then became the fire of gentrification? The inevitable spiraling that Ruth Glass talked about? Hey, how you doing? Good, Justin. How are you? So nice to see you. Thanks for taking the time. To tackle that question further, I met up with Charlie Mano. Charlie is about 60, generous with his smiles, and with a full head of white hair. On the day I met him, he was wearing this bright yellow polo shirt advertising the Italian liqueur company he runs, Lilo Infused Spirits. Lilo is his nickname. The liqueur company is Charlie's second career. His first was as a nonprofit housing developer back in the 1990s. And to show me the legacy of that work, The first thing that he wanted to do was take me up in an elevator to the top of a high-rise building called Villa Mercedes, a couple blocks from my house. It's a real neighborhood landmark. At nine stories, it's one of the tallest buildings around and offers subsidized apartments for low-income seniors. Let's go up and we're going to see a great view of the the city up here. Look at this view. It's the best view in the city. When Charlie and I finally reach the roof, it is jaw-dropping. The skyscrapers of downtown sparkle to the east. The blue, blue lake stretches as far as the eye can see to the north. Look at the view of downtown. Can't beat the view. I have like a, I mean, a, this is my neighborhood. I've Such never a seen view. it like this. Yeah. This gives you a nice wow. perspective. And- but Charlie didn't bring me up here just so we could gush about the view. Although, to be honest, we did do that for a good five minutes. He wanted to show me some of the many development projects he helped shepherd over the years. Yeah, so this was all vacant land. So 
Our big project was the Belvedere that I did, the 20 units facing the lake. He pointed out a mix of stuff, some high-end townhouses with direct views out to the lake, some affordable bungalows with tiny front yards, hugging a side street nearby. But, um, and then those just north of there, which are now, have been redone, those were Section 8 housing. Um, and we managed those for a while. He said the goal of his organization, called Nolasco, was to build and rehabilitate housing for people all across the income spectrum. You know, Nolasco's, you know, our mission statement in a nutshell was to rehab, rehabilitate, and build new housing. And the, the mission was to keep people here, keep people in the parish, keep people in the neighborhood, and attract new people. You're probably picking up on the Italianness and Catholicness of the way Charlie's talking, including the way he used the word parish just then. That's because Nolasco was founded and affiliated with a local Italian Catholic church called Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Even the name of the organization, Nolasco, comes from a Catholic saint. Charlie Mano said when he took over as director of Nolasco in 1990, the neighborhood was at a low point. The population had been declining for decades. A lot of properties were in disrepair. Uh, there was just not a lot of energy about, you know, remaking and revisioning what this neighborhood could be. Do you remember, Charlie, any numbers from, like, your decade working there? Like, how many housing units? You, you know, know, roughly, I can't say. Built? You know what? I would say it's, you know... Uh, we affected hundreds and hundreds of families and homes, either through rehab, either through building, and then buying and rehabbing and selling properties and building. It would be in the hundreds. And I remember we had to do our monthly reports, and we would take over 100 calls a month for any housing-related and or even if somebody had a problem with feeding their families. You, you said one of the things you were trying to do is bring new people to the neighborhood. What was your, like, sales pitch to bring new people here? You know what? Uh, it was the, commun the community feeling of people looking out for one another, a real sense of good neighborliness. And then uh, programmatically with the loans and the incentive programs. Another huge draw when it came to new housing was that you didn't have to pay any property taxes for 15 years. That was thanks to a tax abatement program that Cleveland unveiled in the early 1990s, designed to make the city more competitive with the suburbs. That tax abatement program has always been controversial because people say it deprives the city and its schools of millions of dollars in revenue every year, while mostly benefiting people who need help the least, namely upper-income buyers. But lately, it's become a real hot topic, leading to some of the first real changes in the policy in decades. We'll unpack all that a lot more in a future episode. But Charlie said back then in the 1990s, something radical was needed to flip the script on banks refusing to back new development in a shrinking neighborhood. The banks were just really tough and just, you know, they were going by all their, you know, all their margins and looking at it purely from a financial standpoint. He pointed to the Belvedere townhomes facing out to Lake Erie. Those went to market at 150000 per unit. And people are like, who's going to come in that neighborhood and buy, spend $150,000? And we're like, you give them tax abatement, you get, you make the, the, the loan, you know, a point and a half under the going rate. Guess what? People will come. Those units are going, I saw them for close to 600 now. I mean, it's just unbelievable. A few minutes later, Charlie and I tore ourselves away from the rooftop and walked a block north to those Belvedere townhomes. And suddenly, we just weren't in Cleveland anymore. We were in Florida, or maybe even Italy. There, on a grassy lawn with a view of Lake Erie, a woman in a bikini sunbathed on a multicolor beach chair. A guy named Joe, who Charlie knows from church, leaned over his second floor balcony to say hello. How do you like living here? What's her not to like? <laughs> <laughs> That's darn right. Friends come over and they look and they think that we're on vacation. You are. 
We chatted for a few minutes longer, then walked back to Villa Mercedi. I asked Charlie how he feels seeing the results of his work all these years later. How do you feel? You feel I, proud? You feel I feel very proud. Yeah. I feel a real connection to, because I saw when it wasn't that great down here. And uh, we probably did too good a job. Yeah, yeah. Okay. but uh, we probably did too good a job because I think I priced myself out of my own neighborhood. No, just kidding. I mean that tongue in cheek, but it's amazing. I mean, uh, it, to, to see the, the property values down here. And it heartens me because, uh, and I, I feel great for the people when there's a significant number that stayed here, mm -hmm. stayed here and believed and didn't leave. In your years working in Alaska, did people ever use the word gentrification? Do you remember? Was that ever? Yeah, you know what? Yes, yes. And I think, at least from my meaning and what I take from that is that uh, there's a sense of people from all walks of life and people at different areas like I talked about. That's what makes a neighborhood strong, you know, you know. We need diversity. But like, did people, were people using that term, do you remember back in the 90s, as like something to be careful about or concerned about? I, I don't think it was a concern. I think yeah. it was more, uh, you know, people are gonna have their own beliefs. And at the end of the day, you gotta do what you gotta do. Hi, hi there, Hello. how are you? <laughs> Beautiful day. So you're, you're gonna have, but that diversity of ideas, that, that sense of, you know, other opinions is fine. And, and, and this neighborhood is a real testament to that, that we sorted through that. And then, you know what? If we didn't fight through and do those things, guess what, that could have been still vacant industrial land with blight and dump and you know, all that. You gotta save the heart. This is the heart. The city of Cleveland needs to be saved. It'd be hard to spend an afternoon with a guy like Charlie Mano and feel like he had his heart in the wrong place. Yes, Nolasco built high-end condos, but it also built affordable housing and helped low-income people renovate their houses and even get food. Still, as I walked away from our conversation, I had some questions. Was the higher-end housing that Nolasco built in the 1990s and 2000s another well-intentioned but highly flammable spark, like the Edgewater Park Tunnel that fed the fire of gentrification? When you build high-end housing in a low-income neighborhood, does that always lead to Ruth Glass's network of social divisions which are becoming more rigid? And Stacy Sutton's indirect displacement? Maybe. Then again, all the things that Nolasco did, they're pretty standard ways to try to revitalize a neighborhood. I can think of any number of struggling neighborhoods in Cleveland that have tried or are trying the very same strategies, including building high-end housing. So why did the strategies work here? Some people might say the lake, of course. But we're also not the only lakefront neighborhood in Cleveland that has hit hard times. And some of the others are still struggling, despite trying a lot of the same things Nolasco did here. For now, the question of why this neighborhood has become popular and not so many others in Cleveland might have to remain a mystery. But what I did need to know, and soon, is whether this neighborhood's leaders feel the same way Ruth Glass did, that we're headed down a path that goes in only one direction, toward the fancy, the exclusive, and the inequitable. There are tools, they're just, all of them are a project and all of them require diligence. That's on the next episode of Inside the Bricks, My Changing Neighborhood. Inside the Bricks, My Changing Neighborhood is an IdeaStream public media podcast. It's written and reported by me, Justin Glanville, and edited by Mike McIntyre, IdeaStream's executive editor. Sound design and production by John Nungesser. Thanks also to producer Drew Mazius. Our director of strategic content initiatives is Natalie Pillsbury. Mark Rosenberger is our chief of content. Our music is by local musician Aaron Snorton, with additional music from Audio Binger, Ketza, Crowinder, Johnny Ripper, and Pictures of the Floating World from the Free Music Archive. 
Visit us online at ideastream.org slash inside the bricks, where you can see photos and sign up for exclusive behind the scenes newsletters and fill out a survey to give us your thoughts on the series. Until next time.